Have your ideas and perception of artificial intelligence and the technological singularity changed or evolved in any surprising ways since you began Singularity University? Uh, my views about all of the uh, exponentially growing technologies, in particular AI, robotics, biotech, nano, uh, have changed only in that what's been uncovered to me uh, through the faculty, through the alumni, through the, um, our partners here, is the depth of work going on in parallel that no one knows about. And what I feel as a result of that is that the rate of change uh, is going to be far faster and far more impactful than people believe possible. Why? because there's more capital available in the hands of individuals today than ever before. And more tools for creation, from 3D printing to um, you know, the iCloud coming online. What tools do you need to create? They're there for anyone at minimal cost. And because of that, the barrier to um, impactful creativity has been massively reduced. You know, it used to be that a uh, a sensor system for looking at human motion, for example, cost $5,000 for a, uh, a LiDAR. And now the Xbox Connect has brought the price down for a similar type of system to 150 bucks. These are the sort of things that Dan Barry, our head of faculty and our head of robotics, teaches us here. And as soon as the price goes from 5000 to 150 bucks, all of a sudden there is a hundredfold, a thousandfold as many people experimenting. That's happening over and over again. And so because of that, the number of startups, the number of experimentations, the number of just uh, of, uh, of random uh, ideas that are seeing the light of day and uh, testing their metal in a Darwinian fashion is increasing exponentially. So uh, I think we're in for an incredible ride. Uh, and I, for one, am enjoying every second of it. Speaking of an incredible ride, Ray Kurzweil is often criticized for being too optimistic in his forecasting and in his predictions. How would you rate our chances of surviving the technological singularity as a species? So first of all, I would say that Ray's predictions are not overly optimistic. I think when you look at the actual facts, people will find them to be reasonably spot on. Uh, secondly, you have to realize that we as humans, general, generally humanity, hates change. We love waking up in the morning and knowing that the world is the same way it was the night before. We still have our jobs, we still have the government in power, we still have the same rules and regulations, because consistency breeds safety, and we like to be safe. But What's really going on is that the rate of change is moving so rapidly that there is the seeds of revolution being planted in all kinds of ways. Whether it's robots that will be coming online that could displace massive numbers of jobs or artificial intelligence coming online that can displace jobs or create new opportunities, whatever it might be. Huge change coming that people don't like. So that's the resistance that people have to the predictions being made. Because if they're true, it disrupts their comfortable way of living. Now, the second part of your question about whether we'll survive the technological singularity, um, I think that we are the, the uh, infrastructure of, we are the... Um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the basis for this uh, technological singularity, meaning the technologies being developed, we're developing them and we're incorporating them into our lives. Um, I think, of course, we'll survive it because we're going to be part of the process of this and we're going to be re-evolving who we as humanity are. Our society is going to be changed. If, if surviving means that society remains unchanged, that people remain unchanged, no, of course we're not going to survive it because there will be functional change. We will change the way we 
uh, live our lives, the way we work, the way we interact with people, the way we think, the way we process information. We've been doing this already. You know, life and society of 100 years ago did not survive. Didn't survive the airplane, the car, the cell phone, the computer. Because, sure, you could say that the Amish survived technology the last 100 years, but 99.999% of the rest of the world did not survive it. They changed. In the same fashion, as the technology rolls in, uh, reinvents how we work, live, love, all of these things, um, the way we were will not survive, but we will be something new, something hopefully that makes our lives um, richer and deeper and more significant and longer and healthier and more educated and something that majority of people will love to have. The main task in front of Singularity University students is the 10 to the 9th project, which as you mentioned is the goal to change or impact in a positive way the life of a billion people within 10 years. So my question to you is, does Peter Diamandis have a 10th to the 9th project of his own? And if yes, would you like to share with us? I have a, a couple of 10 to the 9th plus projects that I'm working on. The one that I'm focused on right now is a book that I'm co-writing with a, a friend, Stephen Kotler, called Abundance. And it's the notion that all of these technologies that we're creating are giving us a world of abundance. Uh, that if you stop and you think about humanity's basic needs, and we talk about an abundance pyramid, that at the base of the pyramid there is the need for food and water and shelter. And then as you step up, there's the need for energy and education and health care, and ultimately for freedom. And that all of these needs are becoming empowered and capable with the technologies that we're developing. If you think about the fact that a villager in Africa who is on a cell phone today has better telecom than the President of the United States had uh, you know, 20 years ago, and if they're on a smartphone on Google, they have more knowledge at their fingertips than the President of the United States had 15 years ago. These individuals are living in a world of communications and information abundance. In the same fashion, uh, we are creating a world where as we become more efficient in converting uh, the abundant amount of energy that comes in solar energy to, to the Earth, 6,000 times more than we use in any given year, as we become more efficient in converting it, we'll be living in a world of energy abundance. And when we do that, we'll have a world of water abundance since we're on a water planet where nearly 98% of the water on this planet is in the form of salt water, but with abundant energy we can convert that. Add to that artificial intelligence supporting us in healthcare and education, and we are heading towards a world of abundant living where it doesn't mean a life of luxury for seven to nine billion people, but a life of possibility, where they spend their time meeting their basic needs and being able to dream thereafter. So my project is changing the way people think, that we don't need to be thinking in a scarce uh, world where we start wars to get access to the oil or resources that we need, but that we can live in a world of abundant resources. And it's a mindset that I want to have people understand. So that's one of my projects. The other one that I'm passionate and excited about is gaining access to the resources of the universe. Ultimately, since my childhood, I wanted to be an asteroid miner, and I think that's something which over the next uh, decade I'll be spending time on.